Hello, I'm George Maynham, the Managing Editor of IoT Now, and welcome to today's webinar, the topic of which is how to achieve global connectivity with an open eSIM. It may seem obvious, but reliable connectivity continues to be mission vital for deploying a cellular IoT solution regionally or globally. However, doing so in an optimal way relies on selecting the right technology, and for many organizations in IoT, connectivity simply isn't their specialist subject. The challenge is compounded by the acronym SOUP that surrounds SIM decisions. We have the EUICC, the eSIM, the Global SIM, the Programmable SIM, and many others, but often these are marketed as if they're the same thing when the technology and connectivity provided are different. Sometimes this is misleading, and there are serious consequences to this in terms of cost, coverage, flexibility, and the longevity of a solution. As always in IoT, the dream is to simplify while ensuring maximized performance. So I'm delighted to welcome today's speakers, AJ Joseph, the CTO of iBasis, and Robin Duke Woolley, the CEO of Beecham Research. AJ and Robin will explain the crowded landscape of SIM-related terminology and demystify the different solutions. A key focus will be on embedded SIMs and what it means for IOD, IoT deployment success for these to be open and programmable. Before I hand the floor over to Robin for his presentation, we'll start with a poll to see where today's audience are in their understanding and what their plans and expectations are. In a second, the poll question will turn up on your screen, and um, this will be an opportunity for, for you to, uh, to vote on the question. So uh, if we can have the first poll, please. I'm afraid we're probably having a technical gremlin with the poll, so we may have to come to that later. Um, if uh, Oh, no, here we've got it, finally. Great. Um, so the question is, are you planning an IoT device development deployment that requires cellular connectivity for a fixed or traveling use case? And the possible responses are, yes, for a fixed use case, such as meters or digital signage, but locally only. Uh, the second possibility is, yes, for a fixed use case, but in global locations. Uh, third possibility is uh, yes for a traveling use case, such as a tracker on an aircraft or a ship, uh, but only uh, in local markets. And the, the fourth option is uh, for a traveling use case in global locations. And finally, um, the last option is no, we're not uh, planning a deployment at this time. Um, while the uh, audience are voting, uh, I should emphasize that both AJ and Robin will be staying on at the end of the presentations to answer questions uh, from the audience. Um, to take advantage of this opportunity, simply enter your question into the panel on your screen, and I'll put it to our, our speakers later on. Um, I think people are still um, voting in the poll, although it looks like it's settling down now. Uh, yes, so um, I have Robin and AJ with me to, to look at the findings of the poll, and it looks like um, the majority of our audience um, are planning um, an IoT device deployment that requires cellular connectivity for a traveling use case uh, and globally. Um, is that what you expected to see, um, uh, AJ? Uh, do, do you think that the, the global uh, challenges are, are, are the big issues, and obviously IoT is being deployed globally, particularly for, for traveling use cases. So um, is this uh, the, the outcome that you expected to see? Yeah, it's actually, uh, thanks, George. It's a, great, uh, it's a great outcome because this is exactly what I was looking at and expecting from the audience because this is what both Robin and myself would be covering in the presentation later on. Great, excellent. We've got the right audience, <laughs> which is always a nice thing. Uh, Robin, what's, uh, what are your observations? Well, yes, it's good to see that uh, there are uh, both fixed use cases uh, in, uh, in in global locations and also uh, mobile or uh, traveling use cases. Um, those two represent the uh, the biggest, apart from uh, not doing anything at this time, but uh, looking to see uh, get get some information. So, uh, I think that's uh, that's interesting. And uh, as uh, AJ says, uh, when it comes to eSIM. Um, and the uh, the possibilities for eSIM, it's it's really the global opportunities that are the major ones to uh, to be looking at. Sure, that makes perfect sense. Excellent. So um, without further ado, uh, we'll close this poll and I'll, I'll hand over uh, to Robin uh, for Robin's mm -hmm. presentation. Um, Robin, the uh, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, George. Okay, so moving to my uh, first slide. 
this is um, uh, uh, shows the, the, the growth of cellular IoT uh, connections over the next uh, few years. So the blue line at the top there is the uh, is the total cellular connections or uh, installed base that we uh, anticipate uh, up to 2022. And then the um, red or orange line, depending on what color you see, uh, is the uh, those converted into new cellular connections. And I think the uh, important thing uh, below that is the uh, the next line down, which is uh, expected EUICC shipments. So uh, we can see that that's increasing um, at a faster rate, in fact, than the um, uh, new connections. So we anticipate that by uh, 2022, some 67%, about two-thirds of uh, new cellular IoT connections will be eSIM-related. Um, now, assuming that's uh, the case, uh, that means that eSIM is going to become the new norm, um, that uh, moving from uh, plastic SIMs will be uh, a major drive over the next few years. Uh, and that means that um, uh, you need to start thinking about um, how to make best use of those SIMs, those eSIMs. Uh, may need to make sure that, uh, that uh, you get the most uh, from those, uh, because there are lots of variations. And as we'll see as we uh, go through our presentations, uh, the, um, the, the plans can become quite complex. So moving on to uh, just to remind everybody about the, uh, the, the key use cases for, for eSIM. There are others, but uh, these are the, uh, the main ones. Uh, there are others that are sort of variations on these. So first of all, there's future-proofing. Uh, and these are for devices uh, in the field uh, for many years, say 10 to 15 years or more. Um, may be difficult or expensive to change the SIMs uh, because they're in remote locations. Um, and then committing to a network contract for the life of the product uh, may turn out to be expensive. So rather than doing that, if, uh, if instead there is an eSIM uh, out there that, uh, it, where it's possible to change the uh, network operator at contract change or whatever, then uh, that could be changed remotely. That may not actually happen. It may be that uh, you stay with the network operator that you uh, started with, but it, but it uh, increases the, the, the negotiating position, if you like. So uh, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the, uh, the original um, future-proofing one. Then there's the uh, single SKU, stock keeping unit, where it's important uh, for product manufacturers to have uh, just one item that uh, they can stick into the boards uh, and get those uh, out. Um, so uh, they, may, they, may, they may then need to be uh, shipped uh, anywhere uh, in the world. Um, eSIM capabilities then embedded in the product uh, during manufacture. Um, and uh, when it's switched on, uh, it auto-connects uh, to uh, and downloads uh, the required network profile uh, for the location. And then the third option is uh, high, availab high availability, uh, active switching. This is becoming uh, considerably more popular. Um, it's dynamic switching between networks, high availability uh, at low cost. This is not... Um, this is not the same as, as roaming. Um, it's really to avoid uh, null points. It's to make sure that uh, there is a high availability connection uh, at all times. Uh, so that would depend on the uh, type of application that is required. Uh, it could be life safety related. Uh, it could be something that uh, crosses borders and needs uh, uh, constant um, uh, messaging like um, international coaches and things like that for Wi-Fi. Um, and then there are other types of uh, uh, applications like uh, switching on, um, entering a, a port. So that could be, um, uh, again, Wi-Fi on a, on a ship or something like that, uh, switching between uh, different uh, operators for different countries and doing that automatically. So those are the, uh, those are the main cases. And then what's available now, uh, particularly from um, network operators, tends to be a, a global SIM type of approach. This is a fairly uh, sort of vanilla plan. Um, it's typically one network operator. Uh, it utilizes their uh, roaming agreements. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. Um, and uh, that means you, what, 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 if you have this, you take whatever agreements they have, whatever roaming agreements they have, whether they are optimal or not. Uh, it's a one size fits all. It's not designed for uh, individual needs or coverage, uh, individual needs of coverage or bandwidth and, uh, and so forth. Um, 
And it's uh, now typically provided, if it's provided on an eSIM, uh, it's typically provided with a locked eSIM. So no changes are, are possible then for the life of the product. So it's, it's locked into that, um, which is fine if that's what, you're, uh, if that's what you want. But uh, if you want some sort of flexibility, if there is going to be a need to, uh, to change the uh, requirements during the life of the product, then uh, it's not really optimal. So uh, this is a, a more complex approach. Uh, it takes a little bit of uh, looking at. Um, there is, in fact, uh, more details uh, in a paper associated with this webinar where you can read more, uh, more of the, uh, the plan for this. But uh, say you have um, an eSIM uh, connectivity provider, uh, which is shown in uh, orange uh, in the middle there. And uh, if there is a need to construct uh, a plan that uh, has, say, 15 different countries and therefore 15 different MNOs, now it might be different MNOs in each country, not of the same uh, flavor, because uh, maybe the, uh, the coverage of, uh, of, of a particular MNO is better in some countries than others. So uh, uh, it, it, it's, it, it may be necessary to look at the, uh, the coverage that uh, a particular MNO provides uh, in uh, in a particular country, and then the uh, uh, the uh, data rates that they can supply uh, as well. Um, so uh, looking the, then at uh, uh, the uh, MNOs uh, one to six, um, those are uh, classed here as being in different countries, so six different countries. So a direct connection to uh, MNO one uh, may then provide also a cost-effective um, connection to MNOs 2 and 3. Um, now, MNO 1 also connects to MNO 4, but that would then not provide access to any others. And uh, it may be necessary to get uh, access to MNOs 5 and 6. So then a direct connection to MNO 4 can then uh, provide connections also to MNOs 5 and 6. So in other words, the eSIM connectivity provider needs to calculate uh, what are the, uh, the best rates uh, for uh, this particular requirement? Uh, and uh, a direct connection to MNO1 and a direct connection to MNO4 gets the best plan for uh, those countries, uh, one to six. And then moving on to um, the, the next one, so MNO7, a direct connection to that. But uh, rather than going through seven to get to eight, have a direct connection to eight, because then that provides good access to nine, 10, and 11. Uh, and then on to uh, MNO 12 and MNO 15, the same, uh, the same arguments. So in other words, with uh, uh, six connections from uh, the uh, eSIM connectivity provider to well-chosen uh, mobile operators, then that provides the most cost-effective coverage to 15 countries. So that's um, the, uh, the basis of a tailored uh, eSIM plan. Um, it requires uh, quite complex logic to determine the best match for uh, specific requirements. And it needs to take into account things like uh, local data sovereignty laws, where um, data might need to stay within the country rather than uh, the, uh, uh, taking it into the cloud and, uh, and into other countries. Uh, might also need to cater for uh, permanent roaming issues uh, arising. Uh, so that could be where um, a particular MNO in a particular country objects to um, uh, a device not moving uh, out of the country but being through roaming agreements and then switches it off or um, requires it to be switched off or disconnected from its network. So there needs to be, uh, if that situation arises, then there needs to be alternative ways of dealing with that. So there needs to be uh, uh, a means and ability to uh, flex uh, at any time uh, while, um, while the plan uh, is, is operating. And that's one of the strengths of having a tailored eSIM plan of this nature compared with a, a fixed locked plan. So um, that's the theory. Now I'm going to hand over to um, AJ at uh, iBasis, who's going to take us through uh, some of the things that iBasis provides uh, to, to, to give uh, tailored eSIM plans. Over to you, AJ. Thank you, Robin. Um, so that was actually uh, a, a good uh, framework in terms of describing the overall eSIM and what it does. Uh, 
what I'm going to be talking to you about is essentially covering a little more about the details of this. And uh, this was described earlier in terms of what the agenda of the call was. Um, so I shall skip this and just get to the next slide. So the first thing um, in terms of, uh, you know, laying out the groundwork is what are the pain points that we see with respect to IoT customers that need global connectivity? So if you take an example of a car company or a, a tracker, such as a luggage tracker, now these are companies that need uh, that produce their things, such as a car, and their car needs to be shipped to 40, 50, 60 different countries. So usually what we see with respect to our customer base is these customers do not want to be in a mode where they do not want to be working with the telcos around the world, coming up with agreements in terms of striking them out saying, we need this many SIM cards in 20 different countries of this particular variety, another set of SIM cards in another set of countries, so on and so forth. Instead, what they want to do is focus more on the customer acquisition part. The next thing that we also see is uh, customers do not want to be locked to a particular telco. So usually what happens is when a SIM card comes from a telco, the SIM card comes with the credentials of that particular telco, and to get it to work globally, they usually use roaming across the different countries in the, in the operators that they have relationships with. The net net is when you use roaming, the roaming is the best effort service. So they typically are not, there are no SLAs that are associated with the roaming. And the last thing that's actually very important as well is you as a customer, how do you get to control the overall experience of the data that's coming out from the sims. And that's what I'm actually going to be going through in the next few slides to give you a better perspective on this. So, um, so the first is what's really important in this is um, what's governing a lot of this stuff is the GSMA has come out with something called an embedded sim. Um, I mean, the eSIM is the generic uh, word that's used also called an EUICC, an embedded UICC. Uh, essentially what the eSIM does, it comes in different form factors. And what's really important with an eSIM is that it is programmable. What does that mean? That means the operator's credentials, also known as profiles, are actually stored in the cloud. And you could have 120 different profiles that you own, and you download that over the air to the SIM on a need basis. And the need basis is based on what the business logic is. And I'll talk a bit about that. So uh, what's actually important about iBasis is just to describe the company a little bit. iBasis is about a you know, little over a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, we, were, we have been formed by the uh, consolidation of the international groups of several operators, all right? So we have come together based on the international groups of KPN, which is the Dutch telco, SFR, which is the French telco, uh, MIO, which is the Portuguese telco, and Altice Dominicana, which is the Dominican Republic telco. So the DNA we have is the relationships we have with the telcos. On top of that, we also provide IPX services to, uh, to our mobile customer base and through which we have the ability of reaching 700 uh, LTE destinations directly via our network. And so the iBasis DNA, what I'm trying to get to, is about the relationships we have with the operators. And so what we're trying to do with respect to the service we're offering is we are simplifying, taking the relationships that we have, both on the local side as well as the roaming side, using the service that we are providing, and using that, offering worldwide cellular connectivity to both IoT service providers as well as enterprises. And how we go about doing that at a high level is this, is what we offer 
is a eSIM, and the eSIM typically has, uh, to start with, we start have a bootstrap profile. The bootstrap profile, think of it as the, the profile that comes at manufacturing time. And then in the cloud, we have several other profiles that we've stored in the cloud. And we use business logic based on where the SIM is to figure out what particular profiles to download onto the SIM card. And I'll get into some details related to that. So the use case here is what I mentioned earlier is the car company. So let's say the car company manufactures the car. The SIM comes manufactured with the car. It's embedded inside it. The car gets shipped to the US, car gets shipped to the UK. And based on what is, when it gets shipped, we figure out the location of where the car is and then we download the appropriate credential onto the SIM card. So essentially making that SIM operate local and all using just one SKU, which is a stock keeping unit. Okay. So now if you go to the upper right, the regional gateways, the data coming out from the SIMs, we are very conscious with respect to respecting the, 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 uh, the privacy as well as the regulation within that country. So the data coming out from the SIM is kept within that country so that, you know, in Europe, for example, there are very strict GDPR laws, for example. And so we try to follow the regulation in that country and not take that across borders. Um, the data is also has the ability of going through what we call our policy control systems. So you could be inspecting the data based on the permission of the customer changing it, modifying it, throttling it, sending it to different uh, uh, websites, URLs, all of that, and finally also the analytics that go with the system. So that's the net net of what we're offering. It's a patented system. Uh, we have patents for this, both in the EU, uh, in the US, as well as other parts of the world. And I'll get into some of the details as to Robin was talking about active switching and open ESAM. So one of the things that we uh, view as our unique selling propositions is we have an open ESAM. The reason why it's open is it's not, it's not stuck to a particular operator. It doesn't use the roaming agreements of that particular operator only instead. Uh, the, the case here is this, which is the SIM card could be in a particular location, like the car, for example. It has the bootstrap that I was talking about. And let's say there are three different operators that are available in that particular country. The, the device slash SIM card sends a connection request over to us, which is in the cloud, the selection logic. And it tells us as to what is the location of the car at the current state. Based on the mobile network selection logic, we determine what would be the best mobile network operator to use. It could be the existing operator that we have today that's, that's currently connected to the device, or it could be something else that we determine based on business logic. And the logic could be based on quality. It could be based on rate. It could be based on something else, and I'll take, talk about that something else in the next slide as well. And then based on that, we send a signal back saying, use this, uh, this another profile and change the existing profile that you have. So change the operator credentials from what you have to a second one, and that gets downloaded over the air. The typical download times is usually in the scale of about uh, you know tens of seconds to download uh, and change the profile from one profile to another one. Okay, so this is a mechanism by which we are selecting the best available network connection for this current location, and this is happening actively, or this can happen actively. Now, so one of the things that you get in terms of advantage over here is you're not tied to a particular operator. You can actually switch between the different operators here. And 
so that's how that's why we're promoting this as an open ethos. The other aspect of it is if you look at where the market is and and where it's going relative to cellular IoT connections, the big anticipated growth in cellular IoT connections is in what's called low power IoT. And what we mean by low power IoT is devices that do not spit a lot of data and the expectation is that the battery life of the device is going to be preserved for perhaps three to 10 years. And so the cellular technologies that support that are NB-IoT as well as LTEM. And so using the same kind of mechanism, we have the ability of figuring out based on technology which particular mobile network to be picking up as well. And so you have the same ESIM being the single solution supporting these various cellular IoT connectivity technologies. So some of the other challenges that we've come across and that uh, the solution does offer is using the trust zone that's actually enabled, uh, that's available on the SIM card, because the SIM card basically is the trusted operating system. We have the ability of putting, of having keys being put inside the SIM card, essentially private keys, put in at manufacturing and have the ability of having an encrypted session all the way from the SIM card, all the way to the data center. So there's no possibility of you know, a third party sniffing the data to try to figure out what exactly is going on in the session. And I already alluded to the fact that data sovereignty is very, very important for us as well as for our customers. And we have located uh, our gateways that actually do the processing of the data across the world. And so data coming out from the devices are directed to these gateways and they are kept within the particular region. So take the case of the EU, for example, or be it China, or so we have data coming out from a device, the data remains in that region itself, right? And it can go to the data center in that region itself and does not need to cross any boundaries. And the last thing that I need to bring up here as well, and Robin had alluded to this, with the relationships we have with the operators across the world. So just to give you a sense, iBasis is directly connected to 300 mobile operators today. Okay. And so with that, we have the ability of actually providing permanent roaming because permanent roaming becomes something very important. So typically, the regulation in a lot of places is you could take a SIM which is roaming, but you cannot roam greater than 90 days typically. And so if you exceed that, you start clashing with either the local regulation or the local mobile network operator. And so with the relationships that we have, we have the ability of overcoming this. So <clears throat> uh, something else that becomes very important is a lot of our customers, because they are, they can be relatively sophisticated, sophisticated from the point of view of, uh, you know, you don't need to understand a lot of the telco part. We have exposed both the device management and reporting aspect of our solution, as well as the connectivity management and media control, all via RESTful API interfaces. So the case in point is if you have a device which you need to control, and this is where the customer experience as well comes in, you can actually be changing the, you know, activating the device. You could be suspending the device. You could be terminating the device. You could be getting billing data on the device. You could be setting up different profiles associated with the device. You could also have the ability of downloading uh, and changing the profiles or the operator credentials I was talking about as well. All of this is exposed via an API. Uh, that we that we allow our customers to control. So just to give you some case studies of uh, some of the customers that are using our solution. So the one that um, I want to definitely bring up is a, a company called Symphony. 
So we just had a press release about this um, like a month ago. So Symphony um, uses a solutions primarily in the maritime area. So uh, they use the eSIMs for 4G connectivity, both in oceans as well as river ports. And we have actually exposed both the network and the API for integration with them. And uh, so Symphony has used this for the maritime case as well as uh, you know for ocean cleaning as well, which is another use case that uh, they have us using. Uh, they have they have been using our Eastern's in. Another use case that uh, I'd like to bring up is uh, Nordic Semiconductor. So Nordic is a semiconductor company that's pretty well known in the Bluetooth area. They have, uh, in the past year or so, they've gone down the path of uh, investing in low power LTEM technologies, specifically LTEM and NB-IoT. They have launched the NRF9160 cellular IoT module and those come shipping with an iBasis eSIM. So it's an out-of-the-box instant connection to both LTEM and NB-IoT networks. We have API integrated in with them. And if you're a developer, you have the ability of getting a preloaded data plan, and then you have the ability of topping up on a need basis. A month ago, roughly about three weeks ago, we did a release with Nordic where we uh, have actually put into the field right now uh, both LTEM as well as NB-IoT. LTEM specifically, we have launched in 24 different markets across the world. So we believe we're one of the first in the world to do that. So just to wrap up, uh, in summary, what we have is a solution which provides basically a single contract from one connectivity provider versus, which is iBasis in this case, versus you working with several different telcos. So with one SKU, we have the ability of providing you global connectivity. The second is what's very important in a particular market, and it could be based on coverage reasons or it could be based on rate. We have the ability of switching the profile and either we can do it or we allow you to do it. And so that also helps with respect to the overall customer management, as well as the exposure of both the reporting as well as a whole bunch of other functionality via APIs. And so with that, I'd like to give it back to George. Yes, thank you, AJ. That was great. Um, I think we've got our second poll question about to come up on uh, on screen, and then we can dive into the audience questions. We've had lots of questions from the audience coming in, so that's great. Um, but uh, if you've got further questions, do feel free to send them in now. Um, here's the second poll question, and the question is, in what area will an open global communications IoT provider with eSIM technology help you in your device deployment? And the possible answers are the ability to have a single provider contract and bill so I can concentrate on my IoT uh, projects. Um, the second answer, uh, reliability, having multiple operator options for the same coverage area. The third option is to uh, have the ability to have a single programmable eSIM SKU in all my globally deployed uh, devices. Um, the fourth option is the ability to have my devices obtain optimal connectivity, and that's in terms of cost coverage uh, technology, whether that's LTA, EM, or MBIOT. And finally, I just don't see an advantage uh, for my use case. Okay, so people are still voting. Um, some quite complicated answers to think about, so we'll give them a bit of thinking time. Um, but it immediately looks like almost half um, are, are seeing the uh, ability to have a single programmable eSIM SKU um, as, as one of the most important uh, factors. Uh, Robin, to bring you in on this, Robin, were you expecting the, um, uh, the, the single programmable eSIM to, to be the, uh, the key point that the audience picked up on? 
I think so, actually, yes, because uh, for this kind of requirement, uh, particularly when it's global, uh, then the uh, the single the, the SKU is uh, is by far the the most uh, important use case. Um, so uh, from the manufacturer, one component uh, in the board uh, goes out to anywhere in the world, and then can connect to um, uh, whichever network is appropriate for uh, for where wherever it is. So uh, that, that's a, a complicated uh, situation. Uh, it needs a lot of um, um, uh, preparation uh, for that. So uh, it's uh, perhaps not too surprising that uh, that's uh, important. But uh, but I see that uh, the um, the fourth one, the ability to have my device obtain optimal connectivity, um, which is a fairly general point. Um, but that's obviously um, uh, obviously also very important. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I see that the, the optimal connectivity point actually goes hand in hand with the point above, I would think. You know, if you yes. were a car maker in, in Germany, you want to ensure that, um, I don't know, if you're BMW, you want to ensure that a customer in Argentina is getting sufficiently good uh, quality at the right cost to get a good experience from whatever in-car services you're providing. So it's all part of that equation, I guess. AJ, right. um, is, it, is, is it, are, you, are you thinking along the same sort of lines as... Uh, as Robin, in, in terms of the responses that uh, we're seeing? I think AJ might be having a breather after his, uh, his presentation. Okay, let's uh, let's wrap up on this poll and, and move into the, uh, the Q&A. Um, as I said, we've got lots of uh, questions to get through, so we'll, we'll uh, get cracking on those. Um, the uh, the first question I have is um, is to AJ, um, and uh, uh, it's, it's a really important question actually. I think in terms of articulating the the iBasis solution. Um, so AJ, the the question is how is the iBasis solution different from my local operator with a global roaming SIM? AJ, what's uh, what's your answer to that? Yeah, so uh, so it all depends on your use case, right? So if your use case is going to be you need SIM cards only in your particular country, then there's a very high chance your cellular operator is perhaps the best one to go after. Okay, no question about it. But if your use case is going to be like similar to what I said earlier, that you want to be deploying in multiple countries, and then you start comparing the differences with the single SKU that we are offering with what your local operator can offer. And then your local operator is going to be offering that SIM via, via roaming relationships. One of the things to think about is when you're talking about roaming relationships, when you roam in a country and there is a problem that happens, there isn't typically anybody you can call. You cannot call your home operator and say, okay, I'm having an issue with roaming, correct it. Because usually the roaming relationships are all best effort. And so when you have a profile in the particular country uh, and you switch over to the profile and you make the SIM local, you have better SLAs, you have better control. Uh, uh, and so, so those, are the, those are the big things that actually you know, stand out in terms of having an eSIM solution versus having an operator provided SIM card that's going to be working in different countries. Great, thank you, AJ. Um, another question is coming. It says, if all profile decisions are being made in the network uh, slash cloud, is there some fail-safe mechanism in the card to ensure operation when connectivity fails? Uh, I guess that's one for for you, AJ. Again. Yeah. So typically, the way the card comes is uh, the card has enough memory to handle at least 10 profiles uh, simultaneously. It depends on, I mean, cards have different, different memories, so they can go up to that much. But also one of the profiles that's put onto the card is what's called a bootstrap. So the bootstrap is burnt in at manufacturing, and that always comes with the card. And so let's say in the worst case, something happens with the back end, the bootstrap is always available to continue and provide the connectivity. So it should be, and that should be seamless. Hope that answers the question. 
Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, another question uh, again. I think for AJ, there's there's a lot on the uh, on the iBasis offering that's come in. Uh, can um, the question is can more than one operator profile be loaded to the eSIM at the same time? Yeah, that's what I just said. So you can put up to ten profiles on a SIM card uh, simultaneously, but only one of them is going to be active. Okay, so moving into the next question, how long does it take to switch an operator profile, uh, and is that an involved process, or you know, is it very simple? It's not involved. It's about anywhere from about 10 to 20 seconds to download a profile. Okay, that's great. Um, so moving on. Uh, just, uh, just, Robin, uh, just, to, uh, just to interrupt there, it's probably quicker actually, AJ, isn't it, if the uh, profile is already on the card? Which is correct, absolutely, Robin. You're you're yeah. you're spot on there. I was I was talking about the over-the-air scenario. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So if uh, if it's um, uh, already on the car, uh, that's a text message change or something like that, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Robin, we've got, we've got a slightly um, a different question that's come in. It's about, um, I think, the split in terms of low power versus 4, 4G and 5G forecast for, for 2022. Um, oh, yes. And I guess the question is a little bit unclear, but I think the question is really how do you see that, um, that division affecting um, eSIMs, um, or, or does it have an effect on eSIMs uh, in terms of um, solutions that, uh, services and solutions that will, will adopt low power uh, networks versus uh, 4G, 5G cellular uh, from 2022, and I think it's important that the question says from 2022 because obviously there isn't any 5G um, widely available or available at all in, in, in most markets at the moment. Okay, uh, so, um, the, uh, so the so the the graph that I put up was uh, the, the the total connections for uh, 4G, 5G, and also for uh, MBIOT and uh, LTEM. Uh, it's certainly the case that the uh, growth rate for uh, uh, the low power, the uh, the uh, low data rate and low power versions is is, is far higher than uh, the uh, growth rate for um, uh, high data rate. Um, so um, you know, the, the the high data rate is around about 20% growth per annum. The uh, uh, the low data rate is expected to be much higher than that, and then the composite is about 35%. So. Uh, uh, that's easy to do the math, I think, except I can't do it in my head. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> the price so, uh, the, there's a, uh, now, what does that mean for, uh, for eSIM? Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, we, 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 we've always believed that uh, eSIM goes together with uh, the low power um, alternatives very, uh, very well because uh, there is a need for high volumes. There is a need for as much automation and uh, less manual intervention as possible with the uh, the low data rate uh, versions, the uh, the low power. Uh, so uh, the more that, that those can be put to uh, uh, eSIM, so long as that eSIM is, uh, is is low cost, then uh, then it makes sense to, to to do that and to automate as much of the uh, uh, installation a, a, as possible. On the high data rate, uh, there is much more. Um, ma there might need to be much more manual intervention, depending on what the applications are, because uh, uh, there might need to be technical support and stuff like that at the high data rate end. So uh, it lends itself more, perhaps, to the uh, low data rate than the high data rate. But there's there's always going to be a lot at both ends. So uh, uh, it's it's. Uh, I don't want to make a sort of general rule out of a, out of a specific, but. Uh, um, we, we would see tremendous opportunities for uh, the development of uh, you know, eSIM and iSIM and, uh, and USIM and so forth, all the all the all the variants uh, for the uh, for the low data rate um, uh, and low power versions. Great, thanks, Robin. Um, question has come in for for AJ. Um, it says, I see that uh, iBasis has more than 700 mobile network partners. Um, do you have agreements with um, all of them to enable their local profile? And uh, if not, how many are currently available? Uh, we, we definitely do not have all 700. That would be um, a, an amazing job if we did. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> we, have we have the ability of reaching them directly via LTE. Uh, in terms of... Um, I mean, what I can say right now is we cover, for the most part, we cover North America, South America, Europe, China, the Caribbean, 
Southeast Asia. And in terms of the exact details, we will need to sign that via NDA. Sure, that seems fine. Um, right, um, moving on. Uh, Robin was touching on this, and, and the, the previous question touched on it. We, we were looking at um, readiness for, for 5G, um, and a question has come in that says, will iBasis eSIMs deployed today support 5G when MNOs start to build out their 5G networks? Uh, I guess that's a question for you, AJ, but it, uh, it carries on from, from Robin's uh, point earlier, I would think. Yes, yeah, so if you look at like 5G use cases, right? So you have the uh, uh, the the massively machine type uh, cases, and that is basically banking on what's been defined in release 13 and 14 of 3GPP, which is exactly what we have with NB-IoT and LTEM. And so, and it's the same. It's basically the the eSIM, which is going to essentially take perhaps another form as it goes forward uh, and something that we're working on right now uh, when we get to 5G, but for the most part, the answer is yes. So uh, what I had alluded to earlier, which is the, the announcement that we had with, uh, on you know, having LTEM launched in 24 countries, and we also have NB-IoT, it was in four different countries, which should have actually increased by now. So all of that would be useful, not just in 4G, but also in 5G. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I think so, yes. Um, another question's come in. Um, Robin, this is probably one that you can answer. It's, um, the question is, what's the difference between eSIM and iSIM? Uh, yeah, so eSIM is uh, is, a, is a piece of hardware uh, that is separate from the um, from uh, a module. Uh, iSIM is integrated into the module, uh, so uh, it um, it could be a little piece of hardware, it could be software, but uh, uh, that's the uh, that's the basis of it. So um, GSMA is currently going through a standardisation process for uh, their iSIM specification. Um, that's uh, not not uh, ready yet. So, uh, and that follows the principles of the uh, the eSIM uh, infrastructure, uh, but using a, a different um, piece of hard effectively different hardware uh, at the uh, at the module end uh, compared with uh, the the eSIM. Uh, and then there is a new SIM, which is um, a further variant, um, a specific network operator. Uh, variant uh, of uh, the iSIM principle, uh, which is also inside a inside a module. So, so it has a much think... lower, it has a, a, a smaller footprint basically because it's uh, it's 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 integrated into the module as opposed to a separate uh, component on the board. Great, thank you, um, AJ. Question for you: um, How is the iBasis solution different from a multi MC solution, uh, which has existed for some time now? Yeah, so very quickly about that, um, we're quite familiar with the multi MG solutions. It's usually, so, uh, so folks who don't know, so the eSIM is something which is standardized by the GSMA, the GSM Association. multi MG is proprietary. Um, when eSIM, you, there is no limit to the number of profiles you could have in the cloud, and you could be downloading up to 10, and then you could be switching them on a neat basis. With the multi MC, typically they come baked. Typically they come baked on the card itself, uh, and there's a limit to how many profiles are actually sorry, how many MCs are put in at manufacturing. The biggest thing that we see with respect to multi MC is multi MC being very proprietary. The tier one operators are extremely um, worried and they're reluctant to share their MZs and their profiles onto something which is proprietary because their MZs, their keys, this is their, uh, their competitive advantage. And putting that onto a platform which is proprietary, you will not get the profile from a tier one operator like, you know, like the big ones in the US or Europe or even in China, maybe, I, I mean, so uh, onto a multi-MZ solution. And so that's the reason why it's very important to work with 
what's been standardized, and that's been our approach from the get-go. Great, thank you, AJ. Um, picking a question out. Um, uh, the question's just come in. It says, um, are there different types of eSIMs for different radio technologies like GPRS, LTE, MBIOT, and others, um, or does each eSIM support all of these radio technologies? Yeah, is that for me, uh, George? Yeah, it can be. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so that was something that I did cover. So, uh, so the thing when we talk about single SKU, it's not only single SKU covering multiple operators, but it's also covering multiple technologies. So you do not need to change the eSIM based on the different kinds of technology. So the same eSIM is going to work across 2G, it's going to work across 3G, it's going to work across 4G, it's going to work across NB-IoT, it's going to work across LTEM. Excellent. Um... And I guess related to that question, AJ, um, I have a question here. Do we need to acquire separate or extra certification uh, processes uh, for a cellular model uh, with integrated eSIM? Yeah, so usually the certification that happens is typically between the module maker and or the device manufacturer with the operator. And so that's something that we typically don't get involved in. That's typically the... You know, each of those different the folks in the value chain that actually have to do that. And that's usually a long process. So, so if you're making a device, uh, you have to go through, you know, the, the process of doing that. In Europe, it's pretty straightforward. In the U.S., it's, it's quite difficult. Okay, quite thanks, difficult AJ. Difficult. I've got a question for Robin now. Um, uh, it, it's basically on the topic of whether there's um, variation in adoption between regions, and um, uh, the um, the audience member who's asked the question wants to know if if uh, Asia and, and China is uh, um, it should be it, it is is different in terms of its behaviour to to other regions, and in general terms, would like to know how you see uh, changes regionally in terms of eSIM adoption. Uh, yes, uh, the um, uh, APAC area has the uh, the fastest take up of, of eSIM, but not necessarily a standard eSIM. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the the take up of what we call a standard eSIM is uh, the GSMA uh, technical specification. Uh, now the GSMA is not really a standards body, but uh, they have uh, ventured into this area because uh, there was a need. Um, uh, but the uh, the fastest take up of the GSMA spec uh, is in uh, North America and Europe. Um, but the, uh, the the fastest take up of eSIMs overall is is in is in APAC. So uh, uh, there's a, there's a lot of proprietary eSIMs out there. Yeah, that seems one of the confusing things about the uh, um, right. the, the the landscape at the moment. And you know, it goes back right. to the point I was making earlier that. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of IoT organisations are not uh, network connectivity experts, so uh, I, I guess right. they want to try and abstract the complexity of this uh, away from themselves, yet ensure that they're making future-proof investments. Which I, I guess uh, AJ uh, is, is one of the value propositions of of, uh, of what iBasis has to offer. Do you see that as a role, is to, to kind of making things simple for for your customers? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly what our proposition is. Which is they do not need to. If if you're a if you're a developer who's used to you know working with a uh, an API, we could enable you that way. You do not need to know much about all of the complexity about uh, you know telco stuff, and so all of it is presented via that API. If you're not, we still take care of it. We are. Uh, Essentially, giving you a portal and having you the, giving you the ability to manage your entire connectivity, and so everything else in terms of the relationships, working with different operators, all of that, including the switching, is all taken care of by basis. Great, um, and I've got a supplementary question to that, AJ. It says, um, "What functionalities are available on uh, on the customer API, please?" And they put in brackets. Uh, selection logic configuration, SIM profile management, reporting of events and data usage. So uh, I guess the question is what functionalities are available on the customer API? 
uh, all of that stuff that I showed in this slide is actually available in the customer API. So, uh, so starting from device management, so we have the ability of essentially uh, changing the state of the device all the way from uh, activating the device to deactivating the device, suspending the device, terminating the device, um, reporting on the device in terms of uh, CDRs, as in like, you know, usage stats, uh, location of the device, all of that is available via API. Uh, the, the country list that, or the MNO list that need to be blocked or the whitelist, blacklist, that's available via API. The policies that need to be set on that particular SIM card, that's available via API, as well as the management of the profile, which is, uh, you know, downloading a profile, swapping a profile, that's as well available via API. Great, thank you, AJ. Um, Let's take, uh, I guess we've got time probably only for one or two more questions. Um, so question we've got here uh, is Robin mentioned cost sensitivity for low power. How does an iBasis solution add cost to the uh, bill of material? Uh, I guess AJ is probably the person to, to uh, answer that question, but Robin might have some other views on, uh, on cost sensitivities uh, in relation to low power. Yeah, so it's usually the business model that we, uh, for, for the low power mode, is what we see is we, from a customer point of view, they want to be predictable. And so usually they do not like, we have the ability of, you know, um, giving you a model which is prepaid, it could be postpaid, it could also be charged on a monthly basis, or... It could also be uh, like a one-year plan. And so everything is predictable. You have a particular data usage model. Uh, and for that data usage, you're going to be paying for a SIM card predictable what it costs for that particular year. So we have that as well. So how that helps the customer is that when they're computing the overall cost, compared to like a typical connectivity model, where you know you're paying and you do not know how much you're going to be paying, as in based on how much the traffic is actually consumed, we can give you that information up front itself. Does that help? Um, yes, I think so. I think that's a good response, AJ. Um, so I guess we'll take one more question. Uh, I think there's just enough time for that. Um, the question is, how does automatic network selection ensure the best operator is being used? Uh, is there any steering in place? Uh, I guess that's one for you, AJ, as well. Well, we, we have, so we have different levels of this. We have a level which is within the network we could do steering, or we could give you the card unsteered. We have both options. But then also above that, we could select different operators within a country or within the region. So we have both options that are actually working. So it's steered, unsteered, as well as profile selection. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we're now out of time, so it only remains for me to thank Robin Duke Willey from uh, Beach and Research and AJ Joseph from iBasis, and of course the audience for attending and, and participating. We've had lots of questions and, we're, and we haven't been able to address them all in the available time, so we will uh, try and get back to uh, everyone who asked uh, perhaps some of the more specific questions um, offline. Um, I do hope you've uh, you found the webinar useful, and uh, I look forward to welcoming, welcoming, welcoming you to another IoT webinar soon. Uh, thanks again for your time today, and goodbye. Thank you.